History teaches us that societal challenges don't have a single answer. That there's no single solution to the big issues we face. That there's no single truth. We need to be curious in order to discover. We need to listen in order to understand. If we're biased, we won't see the other sides to a story. Protecting democracy and human rights, improving healthcare, harvesting energy in a sustainable way, supporting economic and technological progress, shaping society requires a broad view and an understanding that many things in life are interrelated. In its search for the best possible answers, Rutbaud University brings together the best in knowledge and facilities. Within seven faculties, teachers and researchers from over 50 countries explore all domains of science, working closely together with other institutes and civil society. With its state-of-the-art infrastructure, our green campus breathes openness, collaboration and shared ambition. It's a place where ideas come to fruition and talents can grow. Every day, we make an impact on society through our students, renowned scientists, leading thinkers and innovative businesses. If such a journey is to be yours, this is the place to be. If you want to shape the future together with us, we invite you to change perspective. Good afternoon and a warm welcome to all of you watching this informative webinar about the Arts and Culture Studies program at Radboud University. Uh, in this half an hour program, uh, I'm going to give you an introduction uh, about the program itself, the student population, the curriculum, about career prospects, and I'm going to be accompanied by a uh, first-year student uh, in this program, Danica, who is going to talk about her experiences uh, of the program. And in order to demonstrate uh, how the education is taking place here and the kind of subjects uh, that we are uh, approaching uh, within this program, I'm going to give you a very short uh, sample lecture as well. And by the end, uh, we'll be available to give answers uh, to the questions, so feel free to send your questions. Uh, and my colleague behind the computer uh, is actually going to do her best to respond to those questions, uh, even um, as, I'm, as I'm introducing the program. So first, uh, a couple of general remarks about uh, the program study itself. It's a three-year program, full-time, and the language of instruction is fully in English. It's important to understand that uh, arts and culture studies uh, is a track of cultural studies, but the lecturers come from two departments, uh, from cultural studies and also from North American studies. That's exactly why uh, in some of the courses um, you may recognize uh, an emphasis uh, on the United States and North America. Our students come from all over the place. Uh, we have students from Finland, Germany, China, Botswana, uh, and of course, uh, we also have students from Holland as well. But about 77% uh, of the student population uh, is foreign, which we are very proud of. This is a point where I would like to uh, introduce Denitsa our first-year student uh, who's going to talk about her experiences in the program. Uh, hello, my name is Denitza and I will be telling you a little bit more about 
how I found this program, why did I find it suitable. Uh, I will tell you a little bit more about the communication between the teachers and the students. Uh, then we will go back a little bit to Lazo, who will tell you a little bit more about the second year. And then again, I will give you information about uh, overall information about the courses from the first year. So yeah, as you can already see, I'm from Bulgaria. Uh, at this point last year, uh, the only thing that I really knew about my studies was that I was either going to study in the Netherlands or in my home, con home country. Uh, and thinking about it now, it was quite of a risk that I took because I didn't even know about the webinars. And uh, because my uncle lived here, the only information I got about the city of Nijmegen, the Netherlands and Radboud University was only from him. So here I am, and fortunately everything turned out quite well. I'm pretty happy with the country because people were really tolerant and really welcoming towards foreigners. I've managed to establish a lot of communications with teachers and with students. And uh, now to give you a little bit more of information about uh, what the studying process goes like, uh, I will tell you about uh, the teaching methods. Uh, the teachers, uh, I've been pretty fascinated with, with their teaching because uh, they really manage to put character in what they're studying and teaching you. They really uh, manage to engage you in, what in the information that they give to you and that really manages to take your attention and help you absorb information as well, which, uh, believe me, comes from a person who has a really short attention span, so I think that kind of speaks for itself. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the established communication, the teachers engage you with questions throughout the lecture and uh, they also are uh, always, uh, wel you're always welcome to uh, ask them f for further information on some of the aspects of the lecture that you didn't manage to understand, for example. Uh, yeah, for a little bit more information for the city of Nijmegen, there are a lot of cultural events that happen here and also in the Netherlands. There are a lot of uh, concerts that are going on, uh, a lot of uh, theater uh, and uh, all kinds of different stuff, to be honest. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty good. Uh, also, there are a lot of parks and a lot of uh, forests around town, which are absolutely amazing. I mean, the nature and nature is really <laughs> nice. Uh, and. Uh, to be honest, uh, you shouldn't expect something like Amsterdam because it's a pretty small and cozy and welcoming town. It's full of students. And uh, yeah. Uh, also, uh, if you're worried somehow about how you're going to interact with the students or the Dutch people, you shouldn't because uh, there are a lot of student associations which are quite uh, welcoming as well and will gradually accept you in their little community and uh, you have cultural excursions as well, so you have a chance to see everything, basically. Uh, also, when you are uh, apply for the program, I should tell you that you should really keep uh, attention to whether you would like to apply for dorms uh, or not. Because uh, I've struggled with finding accommodation here because I did make the mistake of not wanting uh, to be situated uh, in a dorm by Radboud. And uh, to be honest, uh, before uh, coming here, you should at least spend two or three months in advance to try and find something because I got qu quite a hard time with that. So uh, we're going back to Lazno, who will tell you more about the second year. Thank you very much, Danitza. Uh, it's a very useful uh, and very important information. Uh, I'm going to continue uh, by talking about the interdisciplinary nature uh, of the program, uh, which really combines all kinds of uh, different um, areas of study, uh, art history, literary history, um, music, uh, film and television studies, uh, theater, gender studies, and because uh, of, a, of a slight emphasis um, on American studies, uh, you also have courses dealing with American culture. Um, at this point, I would like to invite uh, once again Denitza to talk a little bit about her experiences uh, in the first year. Yep. Hello again. <laughs> yeah, so now I'll be telling you a little bit more about the courses that you have in the first year. So the first year is divided into two seminars, 
and every seminar is divided into two parts. So overall, you have uh, four exam periods in which we'll have uh, one to two exams or final assignments that you have to give in. Uh, you have uh, five courses, as you can see. Uh, one of them is History of the Arts, one, two, three, and four. Uh, you will start uh, at every new part of the semester. You will, sti you will start a new course. It is uh, focused on learning a little bit more about the fundamental basis of uh, the arts. You will d study different artistic periods like uh, Baroque, Antiquity, the Renaissance, and etc. Uh, it's pretty interesting because you really, you really get an uh, uh, overall idea about uh, how the music, literature, visual arts, and theater have developed and from then until now, and how the ideas nowadays uh, are situated in our modern society, basically. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it is very interesting because all the courses are connected with each other. So, uh, for example, if you have history of the arts, which studies the artistic periods, you have European culture, we will teach you more about the social and political states of the uh, European countries throughout the periods that you're learning about. You have image, music, and text analysis, which will uh, teach you how to basically uh, be able to criticize uh, your favorite, for example, literature pieces or musical pieces and really uh, see the different levels of that art has. Uh, you will learn different terms which you can use and uh, yeah, basically uh, it's connected to the other um, subjects uh, because of the fundamental basics of arts. <laughs> yeah, so uh, next you have academic skills in which uh, you will learn how to uh, write a research essay and every week you will uh, learn different uh, things that you can apply in your essays for history of the arts. And uh, also, last but not least, you have the tutor group, which is uh, a really more friendly based uh, course because you will be assigned to a mentor, your, uh, you will, your group will be assigned a mentor, and you will be able to talk uh, to them about everything that you encounter, problems, what you liked about the program, whether uh, you have problems with accommodation, finding a side job, or uh, the Dutch language, you can all uh, take these questions to your mentor and uh, your second uh, year student that will also help you. And they will do everything possible to help you in everything, every way that they can. So again, we're back to Lazo, and goodbye for me. Thank you very much, Denitza. As we have seen, most of the courses uh, in the first year are introductory courses, and this actually trains you to take more specialized courses in the second year. Um, a course, for instance, dedicated to vulgar culture, uh, where we experience phenomena uh, such as uh, kitsch, uh, vulgarity, uh, being offended, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are also courses dedicated to sustainable culture in a globalized world, uh, identity and cultural diversity, American art, American music, and of course, American popular culture, uh, alongside intertextuality, intermediality, um, and elective courses as well. In the third year, uh, the courses get even more specialized. Um, visual culture, uh, city culture, popular aesthetics uh, are uh, courses specializing prim primarily on more difficult uh, theoretical texts. It's also very important uh, in our program um, to, uh, to have uh, access to practical applications to these theories, so you would be asked very often to relate these theories to existing uh, films, uh, artworks, manifestations of popular culture. Uh, the culture of fashion uh, is also a very important, relatively new uh, course uh, that we have developed, um, um, which also gives you uh, a theoretical side alongside something that is very practical. Um, you will have training for your bachelor thesis um, alongside uh, elective courses uh, that you can take. The um, career prospects that uh, students who graduate uh, from our program have is uh, relatively uh, broad because uh, having finished uh, this BA program, uh, you basically choose 
uh, either uh, to continue uh, with an English taught uh, master program or uh, to find employment right away. Now, if you're thinking of the first option, uh, that is, uh, continuing with one of the English uh, taught bachelor programs, you may think about uh, art and visual culture, which is a two-year program, uh, the, creavi the creative industries, which is a new uh, one-year uh, master program, North American studies, also a one-year program, and a brand new uh, one-year master program dedicated to tourism and culture. If you are not planning to continue uh, with your studies at a master's level, uh, there are also various job opportunities awaiting you. Um, we are proud to say that half of our graduates uh, find jobs almost immediately after graduation, whereas 68% uh, of the graduates find jobs within uh, six months uh, after graduating with a relatively uh, fine salary uh, here in the Netherlands. But what kind of career prospects uh, can you think of? Well all kinds of career prospects. Uh, once having graduated from this um, arts and culture studies program, um, you can think of becoming a consu consultant uh, in of, of, of art education for a cultural organization, uh, a program developer uh, for the media industry, a uh, cultural policy maker for the government, for instance, a uh, festival organizer, um, Danica has already talked about uh, the rich uh, the cultural spectrum uh, of the city. We have very good connections with the local movie theater that is actually more than a movie theater. And many of our students uh, start out as volunteers there and later on many of them find jobs um, within that context as well. You can also think of becoming a webmaster at a museum or uh, journalists and program organizers uh, at a film festival, for instance, among many other opportunities. Now at this point, um, I would like to um, demonstrate uh, how uh, a lecture uh, at our department uh, takes place. Um, and I would like to focus on uh, a particular topic which uh, is called Dazzle Camouflage which sounds like a strange term. Um, and in the upcoming couple of minutes, uh, I'm going to clarify uh, what this term means. And in the process, I would also like to demonstrate uh, the kind of interdisciplinary nature uh, of the program uh, that we have here. So if you look at a photograph like this, um, you may find it very difficult to actually make out what you see. What you see is black and white stripes and something that floats uh, on the water. And indeed, it is very difficult to identify that object, which is actually a ship. Um, it's a black and white photograph uh, taken during uh, World War I. You may ask, uh, why is it uh, that this ship, that this boat, has been painted in uh, such a strange way? This is in fact, the USS West Muhammad, an American battleship uh, from 1918. And uh, what you need to understand right at the outset of this lecture is that the goal of this kind of painting was to camouflage these boats, uh, to somehow make them difficult for submarine officers to fire torpedoes at them. And the strange thing is that usually when we think of camouflage, we think of something like this. Um, a person, a soldier, a hunter who blends into the background, uh, very difficult to make out uh, who he is, where he is going, um, because camouflage is usually identified with blending. An object blends into the background or a soldier, a hunter blends into the forest uh, that surrounds him or her. In terms of desert camouflage, on the other hand, what you have is precisely the opposite. Uh, maritime officers realized very soon that it's very, very difficult to hide, to camouflage a ship uh, at the high seas using blending camouflage. Uh, instead, what they did was uh, they painted ships in all kinds of different patterns, uh, as you can see here. Uh, with the ultimate purpose of dazzling the eye of the submarine officer. Even though most of the photographs that we have are black and white uh, photographs, 
some of these camouflage patterns were extremely colorful, sometimes red, black, green, blue lines all over the place. Norman Wilkinson is usually recognized as the founding father of maritime camouflage. You can see him in this photograph, uh, him holding a model of a boat uh, that features uh, dazzle camouflage. And uh, I would like to um, explain to you as to how it works and why is it that they opted for these strange kind of lines um, to be featured on surfaces of battleships. There are three uh, fundamental principles that Dazzle Camouflage follows. One is the principle of closure, which basically stipulates that a closed area appears more formed, more stable than one which is open. Uh, you see these uh, black uh, shapes, and even though there is no triangle, you sort of see that triangle right there because these black uh, fragments of circles define a kind of triangular shape, so they lure you into visualizing that white triangle in between them. The second principle is nearness or proximity, which basically stipulates that the relatively closest distance between sensory units offers the least resistance to their interconnection. You see those two lines on the left uh, forming one group, but once you see two other lines closer to them, you see those other lines as forming two distinct groups. And the third principle, perhaps the most important when it comes to desert camouflage, is continuance. The eye moves along the direction of a hue or gradation, similar to the way it moves along a line, precisely because as we are looking at the ship, uh, in this black and white photograph, our eyes somehow elongate those uh, uh, black and white stripes and then it becomes very difficult to make out the three-dimensional extension uh, of this boat. So this is what a submarine officer sees. Um, on the top you see a dazzle painted uh, ship, very, very difficult to make out where the front, where the back is, um, in what direction it goes, whereas a ship without dazzle painting is actually very easy uh, to identify. And obviously this is very important uh, because during World War I a torpedo was extremely expensive uh, and a, a submarine officer had to know exactly um, uh, how fast a ship was moving at the high seas and in what direction. Uh, and Dazzle Camouflage made it all the more difficult uh, to identify. Um, a right um, proper question at this point might be who designed these uh, camouflage patterns? And this is where art and military or naval techniques uh, merge. Because it was around the time when Cubism as a movement in art was very much in vogue. Uh, you see a painting by Georges Braque uh, here, and the idea uh, is obviously uh, to break with the uh, uniperspectival representation of the Renaissance, and instead representing objects and people from multiple different perspectives all at the same time. And this is what you see in this painting. Uh, this is what Picasso uh, was also uh, busy working out during his artistic career, it is by no means surprised that Picasso was also at one point a designer of camouflage patterns for the military, because this is what they needed. This is what the military and the navy needed to confuse the eyes of the observer, in this case the submarine officer, uh, so that he would see the ship from multiple different perspectives at the same time. Once the war came to an end, one might think that desert camouflage became completely useless. And indeed, uh, with the advance of um, air traffic um, and air forces, uh, these ships could be located from the air and uh, in uh, many different ways desert camouflage lost its relevance. But this doesn't mean that it completely disappeared. Quite the opposite, in fact. Uh, a whole lot of art was inspired by Dazzle Camouflage uh, after the war. Um, most prominently, uh, Edward Wadsworth um, 
in his paintings, Dazzle Ships in Dry Dock at Liverpool from 1919, immediately after uh, World War I. You see this Dazzle painted ship almost becoming one uh, with its physical surrounding that almost looks like uh, it has also been Dazzle painted. Um, very similarly, the countryside in Yorkshire um, appears very flat, appears as different shapes of uh, black and white, very difficult uh, to make out um, where the houses begin, where the houses end. And again, apart from art that was inspired by Dazzle Camouflage, uh, after World War I, it also landed in all kinds of different walks of life. Here, for instance, you see the poster of uh, Cunard Line. Cunard Line was one of the great adversary of White Star Lines, uh, uh, which uh, was the, um, um, the main shipping company for the Titanic. Here you see the Cunard Line, which emerged as victorious after the sinking of the Titanic in 1912. And the Dazzle painted patterns appear at the frames of this poster, almost like something cool, uh, something that can be used for advertisements, uh, something that is, um, uh, it, it could be used to sell a particular uh, cruise. Dazzle painting also appeared on architectural facades, uh, like this barber shop uh, here. Uh, but also, perhaps most importantly, what we are talking about here is the 1920s, obviously the Roaring Twenties, uh, the time of flappers, uh, the time of new fashion. And perhaps it's no surprising that Dazzle painting uh, also was used by bathing suit designers that you see these three girls uh, wearing, apart from many other uh, manifestations uh, in the arts. You may think that um, with the 20s, with the Jazz Age and the Roaring 20s, the time of Dazzle painting is completely gone, but this is definitely not true. Dazzle camouflage or Dazzle painting uh, is still widely used uh, today uh, as we speak. Um, the 100th anniversary of World War I uh, is taking place uh, as we speak. Uh, in many museums, including the Imperial War Museum, uh, there have been many exhibitions uh, dedicated to Dazzle painted ships, and lots of cafes uh, had also been transformed uh, into uh, Dazzle painted uh, areas. But also, uh, sometimes as you're walking in the street, uh, you see cars uh, going by and featuring all kinds of uh, black and white shapes. That's also Dazzle painting. And the reason behind it is actually something very similar that inspired the Navy or um, naval officers uh, to deploy to have Dazzle painted patterns on their ships. Here, uh, when you want to put a new car on the market and you want to test it out, first you don't want people to see, to identify that car, and Dazzle painting comes uh, very handy to disguise uh, that car. But finally, and I would like to conclude with this, uh, we don't have to go so far to see Dazzle painting in action. Perhaps in each and every walk of our lives, uh, we see Dazzle painting, we use Dazzle painting when we put on pullovers uh, that are uh, striped. Horizontal lines certainly make us appear uh, a little bit more thick corpulent, whereas horizontal lines elongate our bodily proportions. And at this point, I would like to thank you very much uh, for paying attention uh, to my lecture. Indeed, what you can see here is a kind of combination of all kinds of different disciplines, uh, military science, visual culture, art, and art history. Uh, and this is what we encourage uh, that uh, you do, that you adopt, that you celebrate, and that you embrace uh, throughout uh, this, mass, this uh, uh, bachelor program, Arts and Culture Studies. And at this point, uh, Denitza and I are ready to uh, answer questions uh, that you may have. Thank you very much, Denitza. So um, the first question, uh, does this program prepare me for a career in theater? 
to answer this question uh, briefly and uh, to the point, uh, no. But this doesn't mean that you are not going to have classes about or on theater, especially in the first year courses when you get the all these introductory courses, you will have an introduction uh, into the history of theater, you will engage with all kinds of, um, of theater pieces, but at the same time the program will not train you directly uh, to pursue a career in theater. Certainly, it's a good platform to start with, but after finishing uh, this program, uh, you may have to do uh, something more to start a career uh, in theater. The second question, um, what is a minor exactly? And this is a very good question uh, because uh, in different study programs, especially in the United States, a minor is basically something that you can have a particular uh, diploma, a particular degree for. In our program, a minor basically means a group of elective courses uh, that you can take. And I have a third question here as well. Uh, do you get to do anything fun next to your studies? Well, um, I am definitely not the person to answer this question because I'm looking at things from the other side of the table. So. Let me turn to Denitza to uh, address this, uh, this question. Well, yeah, I would say that definitely n uh, studying is not the only thing that you sit and do. Uh, there are a lot of things that you can do. Uh, I already told you that there are a lot of concerts and cultural events. I uh, even like I've been here for three months, I already went to two concerts. Guns N' Roses are visiting in January right here in Nimehen. So there are a lot of things that you can do, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> from the point of view of the teacher, um, even though I spend most of my time obviously uh, researching and preparing for my, my classes, I can also subscribe uh, to the fact that Nijmegen is a, is a very rich city in terms of culture, offering a whole lot of uh, festivals, including, for instance, uh, the festival Go Short, which is perfectly dedicated, uh, it's only dedicated to uh, short films, uh, which is uh, one festival that made uh, Nijmegen famous among many other festivals. Thank you very much you. Uh, for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, and I'm sure you will have, please feel free to contact us uh, via email and visit our website. Thank you. <laughs>